So in section 9.3, we're going to be working with the population standard deviation and therefore also the variance because remember, variance is nothing but the standard deviation squared. Okay, now I don't know if you noticed, but in section 9.1, when we were working with proportions, we were using the standard normal, i.e. the Z distribution. And then in 9.2, that wasn't going to quite work because we didn't know sigma. We were stuck with S, which is weaker, so we needed the guy that worked at the brewery, Gossett, to come up with the T distribution, and that's what we used. For variance and standard deviation, we're going to need something else, namely the chi-square distribution. Okay, now this is a new distribution, and it doesn't really work like normal in T. Um, T we kind of fudged through, but it was okay because the T looks so much like the normal, it, you know, it was no big deal. The chi-square, on the other hand, is going to be a bit different. So, Let's figure out how the chi-square works, so that way we understand it a little bit better. We are going to pretend that we are going to take 1,500 samples of size n equals 10 from a population that is known to be normally distributed with a mean of mu equals 0 and a standard deviation of sigma equals 10. Now, I did this, um, you could do it easily in um, StatCrunch, by the way, and no, you do not have to do this for your technology assignment, at least not yet. But all you have to do is go to simulate data under the data thing and you say, I want to simulate normal data. And you tell it, I want 1,500, or excuse me, 10 rows, 1,500 columns. So it'll do 1,500 samples of 10 each. You tell it you want the mean to be 0, you want the standard deviation to be 20, and you say go, and it'll do all of them for you. Cool, huh? Impressive, right? Okay, so I just did that. Again, you do not have to do that. Don't worry about it. But that's what I did. And then I copied and pasted it all into Excel for myself. There they are right there. And then I had Excel find the mean. See this top row right here? The mean. So it's saying, what's the average of those numbers? What's the average of those numbers? What's the average of those numbers? And so on. Right? You can see the little average formula. And I just dragged it across all 1,500 rows. Right? Again, don't worry about doing this. You do not have to do this for the technology assignment if you're following along for the online class. But that's what I did. Okay, so I did that. And then I had a mini tab construct a histogram of those means. So I took this column back here, or this row. I took this row of means and I had it calculate a histogram, construct a histogram for those means. Awesome. So that's what this is. It's a construction of the X bars for all the samples of size 10 that we had sitting there in Excel. And this is where the means fell. And if you did it again, you'd have a slightly different histogram. But it would always follow this general shape, which is what exactly? <laughs> okay, so that's what they're saying here, that we constructed a histogram of the means. Got So these bars would add up to 1,500 if you did it. So like, I don't know, there's like 10 there and 8 there and 11 there and 18 there and so on. And if you added and added and added at all the bars heights, you'd get 1,500. Now, according to the central limit theorem from section 8.1, we should know quite a bit about how this works because that's exactly what that central limit theorem was working with, namely the distribution of X bars. How do the sample means distribute? Well, they should have the center that the population did. So since I, when I did this with StatCrunch or Excel or whatever, I told the computer to have the mean zero, then therefore the mean is zero. And you can see it kind of is, right? That's sort of the vertical symmetry line for this graph, the center line, if you will. What about the spread? So I, when I did this with the computer, I said, hey, computer, make the standard deviation 20. And it did. But the standard deviation here is not 20. Everybody should see that, right? Standard deviation, if it's normal, means you have about 95% between 40 and negative 40. We're not getting nearly that far. We're getting the computer going 5, 10, 15. Well, that's because we're looking at X bars, remember, not Xs. The individual scores, if I took mm, hold on, all of these individual scores, Right, 1,500 times 10, so 15,000 scores. If I looked at all of those and made a histogram, yeah, then they'd be going out to, to 40 and negative 40 and you know 50 and negative 50, all that stuff, because the standard deviation on these ones is 20, right? But the standard, see, look, there's a score at 35, there's a score at 33, there's a score at 25, and so on, okay? There's a 43. But the X bars don't get that far up or down, right? Look, so the average they're not getting nearly as high as 40s and 30s. Right. 
Well, because you're looking at averages. Remember that was chapter eight. We're looking at the means instead of the individuals. When you do that, you're going to shrink down your spread, right? So it's not going to be as high up. It's not going to be as low down because everybody balances out. So yeah, you had a 43, but you had a whole bunch of other scores in there too. All right. So how much does it shrink? Well, it depends on your sample size. Remember the bigger the sample, the more it shrinks. So it's sigma over the square root of n, which is 20 over the square root of 10, which is about 6.32. I just found it with a calculator. Everybody sees why you need a calculator in this class that can do square roots, right? There you go. Okay, so do the numbers um, from the computer simulation appear to hold true to this? Well, remember, according to the central, I'm not the central limit theorem, the empirical rule, about 95% will be plus or minus 12, right? Because two standard deviations is 12 and some change. Look at this histogram right here. 12 is over here. Negative 12 is over here. Isn't the vast bulk of that material in the middle? Yeah, yeah. I mean... It appears the center of the histogram is still zero, just like we said. And then it looks like the inflection points are around six. And it looks like about 95%, oops, I hit the caps lock, about 95% of the data are falling between um, negative 12 and positive 12, right? Because that's two standard deviations, give or take. So yeah, it's totally doing exactly what we would expect. Love that central limit theorem. It's actually true. I didn't make it up. Now, what about the population variance? So we know how the means should work because we learned that in 8.1. But how about the variances? How should that work? Okay. So what I did was I had, um, here's a sample right here. <sighs> Sorry, okay, so what is the population variance? The population variance, all right, remember the population standard deviation was 20. So then the variance is 20 squared, which is 400, right? Remember that simple calculation from chapter three. All right, what would be the degrees of freedom? Well, every sample we took was size 10. So take away 10, or take away one from 10 and you have nine. So nine is your degrees of freedom. All right, so now what? I'm going to box this right here. All right, suppose we recorded the sample variance, S squared, for each of the following samples. So I did that. It's not hard to do in Excel, right? So I made Excel find the variance. You can see the formula. Hold on. There we go. You can see the variance. Dink. I found the variance of this, and then I found it again and again and again and again. So I found the variances for all of our samples. Okay, so I did that, and I showed in the notes, I showed the first one, right, that first sample, which I believe is the first sample from right here. See, this is what I put right in the notes right there. So I found that right there. Right. And then what I did after that was I found the chi-score statistic. So somebody invented this statistic just like Gossett invented the t-statistic. And what the chi-score statistic is is n minus 1 times s squared over sigma squared. Well, re remember, by the way, the n minus 1 part, let me scroll back. The reason that we're doing that, well, there are multiple reasons, but you know, for your purposes, the reason you're doing it is because s, the denominator of s is n minus 1. So, you know, s squared, it's n minus 1 squared. So you multiply by one of the n minus 1s there to get rid of one of them. That's all. So that's where it comes from. Now, why you do that, that's kind of a graduate level question. We're not going to answer that part. Okay, so we take n minus 1 times s squared. Oops, I should, I should have squared this. So s squared. Oh, no, we did. Sorry, that was squared. That was the variance that I had the computer find. So it's just 377.7. Sorry, I was losing my brain there for a second. And then we divide it by 400, right? Because we know that sigma squared is equal to 400. We found it up above. And we get the value of about 8.49. Okay, so you take the sample that you had, you found the variance, you divide, you, you multiply it by n minus 1 and you divide it by 400 every time it's 400 because that's the population variance, right? And we did it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's right here. See it? I took 9, which is n minus 1, times that 377 and I divided it by 20 squared and I just did it over and over. I dragged it across, right? 
correct. You guys know Excel better, so you know this wasn't actually that hard to do. It was just a little tedious. But again, you do not have to do it for your technology assignment. I might eventually make a project or something out of something like this, but you guys don't have to worry about that yet. All right, so what do you notice about this distribution? Um, look here. Here's the histogram of those chi-squares. So I took these chi-squares down here, this chi-square values, and I had Minitab make a histogram of it, and that's what I graphed right here. So this distribution does not look like the normal distribution at all, okay? Other than it's got bars in it, but that's about it, okay? So how is it different? Well, you should notice a couple very obvious things. It is always positive. This graph, see it? It gets to the zero. It never gets past that, ever. It will never be negative, ever. Why? Well, because it was built out of the chi squared, right? Everything was squared in here, except for n minus 1, but that can't be negative, right? So if you're taking things that are squared, then they're positive. That means that this graph is always positive. And it's always right skewed as well. Always. Okay? So just keep that in mind. And it has to do with the fact that it's cut off and it has to do with some other things. But it's always positive. It is always right skewed. It is not symmetric. Right? The normal curve and the t-curve, those suckers were symmetric. They were symmetric around zero. This is not symmetric. So that's going to make your lives a little bit more difficult. All right. So that's what the chi-square distribution looks like. This particular one was for n equals 10, which was degrees of freedom equals 9. All right. All right. Now, the thing about this is, is that the chi-square distribution actually varies depending on your degrees of freedom. So you could have one with 2 degrees of freedom. That's the blue one right there. Or you could have this pink one right here with 5 degrees of freedom, 10 degrees of freedom, and so on. Okay, so 10 degrees of freedom, this orange one, that's actually very similar to the one we did up here. This one's actually 9 degrees of freedom, so the two of them would be very close to each other. Okay, so just like the T-curve, there's infinitely many of these, right? So there's tons and tons and tons of them, depending on your degrees of freedom. You could have one with 40 degrees of freedom, 42 degrees of freedom, 43 degrees of freedom, 44 degrees of freedom. You, you get my drift. All right, so what are the, some properties of these distributions? One, they are not symmetric. I know that was a blank in the notes, but I had to put it here underlined. So they're not symmetric. Their shape depends on your degrees of freedom, just like the T distribution. As the number of degrees of freedom increases, right, as we get larger and larger, go from the blue to the pink to the orange to the green to the purple, the purple's the best one of those, it's getting more and more symmetric. It's not perfect still. It's still right skewed. It will always be right skewed, but it's much less noticeable in the purple curve than it is, say, in the pink curve. All right. Oops. And the values of chi-square are non-negative, i.e. it's always greater than zero, always. Because this chi-square distribution is not symmetric, we're not going to be able to construct a confidence interval for us squared like we did before. You know, in section 9.1 and 9.2, we would take our point estimate, plus or minus our margin of error, be done. That's not how it's going to work. We're going to have to um, do it longhand, first of all, and we're going to have to use a little bit of know-how from a chi-square table, okay? Because we have a table of values that will give us these numbers, and that's what we're going to pick up with next time.